Good, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy that you were able to join us for this workshop. I was looking at the responses and I love that, you know, some people responded, the succulents, the cacti, and perhaps maybe a little exciting to me is those of you who responded about the shrubs. I spent years as the curator of the shrub collection at the Desert Botanical Garden. So I have a very um, fun attraction and association with our shrubs. And I think I need to once again be made a co-host so I can share my screen. Are you able to change that for me, Jill? Yes. My apologies. Yes. Oh, excellent. All right. Oops. So our topic this time around is plant selection for your desert garden. It is amazing the wide array of plant material that we have available from our local growers. A lot of the nurseries were, they, they had a smaller selection available for our desert gardens. I'd say when I first moved here over 30 years ago and the progression of um, you know this expanding plant list of things that are so fun that we can play with and have in our gardens, I think is just super exciting. So there are some things that you need to think about. And overall, the best approach that we recommend, um, including you know, Scottsdale and a lot of other plant enthusiasts, is that you follow the concepts of Xeriscape. Now, it's not Xeroscape, and some people do mispronounce it. I think even more people um, misconceive the whole idea. Um, so it's not Xeroscape, but the, you know, barren, I mean, who would wanna come home to this? That would be, especially for a plant lover like myself, just very, very depressing. What we want to encourage is xeriscape, um, kind of combining the word landscape and um, the old term zero or xeric, meaning dry. So dry scape. And it, the whole concept is just having a great landscape that is appropriate for your region and can help be more water efficient. So what we want everybody to be able to enjoy around here, uh, you know, beautiful settings, comfortable, water efficient outdoor living spaces. And these are all examples of water efficient landscapes. There are overall seven principles of Xeriscape. You can explore this further if you visit, if you don't have one of these wonderful booklets on hand, if you go to the amwa.org website, you can access this publication online and it's just a, a good resource of great information. So you see missing here is number two. That's what we're going to focus on right now are the low water use plants that can uh, bring so much beauty and enjoyment into our garden settings, but yet, still be water efficient. This booklet is also available at that mwa.org website. You can have all these just very, very exciting textures and forms and colors, seasonal interest with our Xeriscape landscapes. Um, here you can have very almost you know, lush appearing settings in your gardens, but these again are all very drought tolerant, water thrifty plants. It's all about choosing the right plants. Um, there are such a, we have such a range of plants 
that you can make selections that will be compatible to your desire as far as what you want your garden to look like, whether you want it to look more lush or whether you really um, love all these incredible forms, you can choose your focus and have numerous plants that will be very, very easy to use in your gardens. You can have bursts of color seasonally that not only are pleasing to the eye, they can also accommodate hummingbirds and butterflies, other pollinators that we need to be supplying sources of food for, especially um, something very simple. This is a landscape just installed, you know, not even a year old. You can see how many colors and forms we have just in this one area that will progress from season to season, having different focal points of interest. And for all the cactus haters, um, I know not all of you are because of the responses to, your, to the poll, um, but for those of you who just think cactus are horrible, open your eyes and look around. There are cactus such as the purple prickly pear that year round can offer a very interesting, unique color with its purplish pads. Otherwise, in season for individual types of cactus, when they're in bloom, oh my gosh, these flowers can rival any rose in appearance and some of them also in fragrance. Seasonal burst, we're, we're right into our spring um, annual wildflower season where you can have just riots of color in your gardens that will kind of come and go. And that's kind of a fun thing, having those changes within your garden. Overall, I'd say that is so much more desirable than a setting such as this. And it really doesn't have to be any more work than a more stark setting like this. Um, of course, there's so much work involved with taking care of turf spaces. And I do want to mention the concept of Xeriscape does not exclude turf, but be wise with turf areas, only have them where they will be used and in um, basically the smallest proportion for the activities of people or pets. Let's look at some of the benefits of using desert plants. Certainly, they are the most compatible with our very harsh environment. We have intense sun here. We have extreme temperatures in the sun, summer. That sun and, and temperature combined make it really difficult for non-desert plants to flourish. The soil conditions are also a great challenge for non-desert plants. The desert plants generally have incredible adaptations that allow them to thrive in conditions such as we find here. And one of them is a reduced leaf surface. If you have a smaller leaf, that will translate, translate into less water being lost through the plant's leaf tissues into the atmosphere. So that's a great adaptation. Some plants such as the Ocotillo have the ability during times of drought to just drop their leaves. If you don't have leaves to lose moisture, you don't lose moisture. So that's another adaptation that we can find with a lot of our desert plants. Many of these plants have a protective leaf surface. So many gray and silvery foliage plants have a pubescence or a hairiness to them. If we look closely, especially on the new growth of a desert marigold plant, there's just this network of very, very fine hair-like structures. Something like our creosote has a resinous coating on the leaf that protects it and can help slow the loss of moisture into the atmosphere. A lot of the plants that are just fabulous to use in our gardens are what we would classify as succulents. Those are plants that have the ability to store moisture when it's available in their tissues that can be a reserve to draw upon 
during future periods of drought. A lot of our fabulous succulents or what we would consider leaf succulents, they store moisture in their leaf tissues. Of course, that's um, very evident in aloe plants of different species. <clears throat> Pardon me. Also, our ice plants, they've got those plump, juicy leaves, another type of succulent. There are also stem succulents. Our cacti fall into this category. And to a lesser number, we do have some root succulents. They store moisture in their root system. And most likely it would be like this example, the Arizona queen of the night cactus. This would typically be your soil level and below ground, underground, you have this tuberous root system that can store a great amount of moisture that enlarges year after year as the plant ages. So those are our, our types of succulent plants that can be used here in our gardens. We can have a, a range, as I mentioned, of textures and forms that are so exciting. I grew up in Michigan and you know we didn't have these awesome forms such as our prickly pears and our saguaros. Um, there was, I think, one yucca we could use in the landscapes at that, um, in that area. But overall, we can have so much fun. You can have a landscape that's um, very simple to maintain, such as this, or even one that is predominantly native plants that looks very natural. Either way, when we're working with our, our xeriscapes, generally, they are going to be overall lower in maintenance requirements by the use predominantly of desert adapted plants. Most of them will be drought tolerant. They won't re require as much water. Generally, they have low, if any, fertilizer needs and often very little pruning, especially if we don't overwater or over fertilize. There isn't much need for pruning on so many of these fabulous plants particularly if we include native plants in our landscapes, they are the best at providing food and shelter sources for our native wildlife. And there are some non-native desert adapted plants. We have so many that um, come from Africa or arid regions of Australia or the Middle East that can be included into our landscape palette. But um, the natives are the best at accommodating our wildlife. And something like our fabulous native blue Palo Verde is one of the favorites of our native little verdant birds. They're not much larger than a hummingbird and they're just the most curious, um, intense birds that are, are very, very active. They seems like they never just stay in one place. And they build an interesting egg shape nest with a side entrance. And as I say, very often they'll choose our native blue Palo Verde or sometimes our native ironwood tree. The use of our native milkweed plants is important to support the populations of monarchs that migrate through our area. And for nesting, um, so many of our native plants are perfect, you know, are perfectly gnarly for something like a cactus wren to build its nest. There are some great resources from the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension System. You can access free to everybody a wide range of publications. Um, you can just go to the extension.arizona.edu um, forward slash pubs. And here you could find something like plant selection and selecting your plants or selecting planting and staking trees. A whole, whole wide range of very, very useful and informative publications that can guide us in the right direction in so many things we're doing in our landscapes and gardens. To start with, you need to assess your landscape area. You need to think about what the sun exposure is, and that's every day as we you know, travel through that um, course of the year, that sun exposure will change sometimes very drastically depending on 
where you're looking in your yard. So keep that in mind. Um, and you need to combine that with the light requirements or needs of the plants you're interested in. So you have to do a little research and know the plants that you're interested in and know what they need to find out if they're the right plant for the right place in your garden. This is a great example with the sago palm. This is, this is one setting, probably, oh, not even more than 15 feet apart, very different sun exposure. This one is receiving a little too much sun. This is what is an indication of a healthy form of a sago palm, but with a bit too much direct sun, you're seeing burning of the leaves. Over here, there isn't quite enough sun. So the sago palms, they're not the best in all day direct sun, but if we put them in um, areas where they're not receiving enough sun or you know, bright enough light, then what happens is there's a, a great change in these forms. It's the same type of plant, but this is, you know, kind of wispy and a little um, slight in character, I'd say, a little slight in form compared to this. So this is an indication certainly of insufficient light. Now, sometimes a plant might have enough light to have good growth and development, but it might not be quite enough for a really dynamic bloom. So all of our plants have a certain bloom potential. If there's not quite enough light, that could be diminished. This is an example of one of these wonderful um, Chihuahuan desert plants, one of the Leucophyllums or Texas Rangers. They love and prefer all day sun exposure. This example is getting shade from a mesquite tree in the morning and then early afternoon it starts to get direct sun. We can almost draw a line down the center of this shrub over here. There are hardly any blooms. This is one of the white blooming forms of the Leucophyllum frutescens or Texas Ranger. Over here, these branches are just loaded with blossoms, with flowers. So there's a, a very, very distinct um, difference between not enough light and sufficient light in this case. This is Kirti's shade scale. When I, when I think of light shade, I kind of, in my mind, think about Apollo Verde and that filtered sunlight coming through. On the ground here, we see that dappled sunlight. That I would say is a light shade. Kind of mid range, a moderate shade would be under the canopy of a mesquite. Mesquites oftentimes have a little bit denser foliage than Apollo Verde, but still it's not dense, dense shade. When we have something like one of those ficus trees or one of my favorite Texas ebonies, that produces a deep shade and it is difficult to get anything to thrive in that type of a shade. Here is an example, a couple of Texas ebonies along this building, and somebody came up with a great design here. They have a, just a great sweeping arch of plants through this extended bed that travels the length of the building. Under the canopy of these trees, it's so dark. The plants, I had to lighten this so you could actually see, um, the plants are practically laying down or just, you know, um, not just a skeleton of what they should be. If we follow this design further out past the, the shadow of those trees, all of a sudden you can tell what they are. They're performing, they're able to bloom, they're able to stand up right and, and be seen and thrive. So light and shade is very important to assess in your landscape so that you have the healthiest, most productive plants. And certainly cacti will respond if they don't have enough light, um, they will become what we call etiolated. And a, a, a leafy plant 
can have etiolation too. Usually it's leggy growth that's pale in color. With our cacti, what happens is etiolation is um, evidenced in what a former cactus curator at the garden called pointy heads. Without enough light, that, that growth just declines. Once this happens, that's it. Uh, this, you know, that, that stem segment can't plump back out. If you put the plants in sufficient light, they'll have that constriction um, for the rest of their life, rest of that stem's life. Now, it's important to know the light exposure for plants' performance and, and well being. Also, think about some of your plants when they are backlit by the sun in the early morning or in the evening a whole different character just starts to sparkle and shine on some of these plants. So many of the cactus with their spines will just start to glisten and glow. Other plants, they um, just become these vibrant sparkles in your, your garden. So think about that too when you're fine tuning placement of some of your plant materials. How can you draw out those special features um, at certain times of the day or certain times of the year with these plants. It's important to know whether your plants are cold tolerant or some people refer to it as cold hardy. Um, years ago, I wasn't so concerned with this, but more and more we've had some, you know, in the last 15 years even, we've had some pretty wicked freeze episodes where I certainly look at the frost tolerance or cold hardiness of a plant when I'm thinking about where to place it. Something such as this smooth leafed agave, when we get down to about 30, it can really start to suffer some damage. And this would occur with the drying, or it almost looks like burning of these leaves from the tip back usually. That's permanent damage on those leaves. And with our succulents, these, a lot of these plants, those leaves are there throughout the life of the plant, or at least for many, many years. It's not like they're going to drop them and have new leaves next year. So it's not such a big deal. This is, this is a big deal. Uh, most often it's cosmetic and doesn't go any further into a rot of the plant, but we want to try to avoid this by knowing the temperature ranges in our areas and thinking in terms of what plants fit with that. Here is another wonderful succulent, the elephant's food. I love this because it's so adaptable to all kinds of conditions of sun exposure and, and whatnot. And here we have, when we get down into the 20s, you can expect some damage on this. It turns out this is just you know superficial. And at the end of the winter season, you could clean this up if there was actual dieback of any of the stems, or you might find that it was just the leaves that dried. But we do want to be aware of this. Some of our leafy plants, uh, when they are affected um, by a freeze, very often it looks like the leaves burn. The, even some of our natives, such as the yellow bells, might in temperatures around mid 20s can suffer freeze damage, or our native chuparosa, same thing when we get down to mid or low 20s. And when we get down past about 30, you can expect some um, freeze damage with your bougainvillea. So we just wanna be aware of this and look for what we call microclimates in your landscape. Those are areas that might tend to um, get colder um, during the winter or hotter in the summer. And it's important to choose plants that would best perform in those extreme settings of those little microclimates. Um, some of the years, like 2012, I think this was, oh my gosh, around areas of the valley, just you know, two thirds of a lot of these ficus trees just literally died back because of the extreme freeze damage. So think about that in selecting your plants. So many of our natives are more cold tolerant and there are a lot of Australian plants also that are very um, cold hardy that could be used in colder areas of the valley. We need to be aware of the limits 
as far as water for our plant. Some are more drought tolerant than others. <clears throat> Pardon me. For many of us who have been gardening, we're quite aware when a leafy plant is in need of, of water, but our succulent plants will also tell us. Um, for instance, this cow's horn agave, um, when it had gone maybe a week too long in between waterings, these leaves even changed orientation, becoming uh, more upright so that the sun wasn't hitting as much of the surface of the leaves. Um, with a good watering around the, the root system of the plant, um, it would, if we catch it and, and if we're paying attention and catch that, then the plant can rebound. Um, and cactus, they'll wrinkle very often um, if they're in need of water, if they've um, used up a lot of those reserves that a succulent plant can draw on. If perhaps, um, you know, some of you might be in an area that still receives flood irrigation, if that's the case, pick and choose plants that would just um, go yay every two weeks during the summer when that good deep soaking comes through. Be really familiar with all aspects of your soil. And if you've got a big property, you wanna make sure you kind of test the soil in different areas, um, but understand what the soil texture is um, that will affect how water moves through it and how nutrients um, move through it or, or are provided. Um, be aware of the drainage of the soil. And the pH, generally pH is alkaline here in our desert, but some areas are, are quite extreme. Um, or if perhaps there are any salinity problems, is your yard pretty much level or do you have big slopes? That would also be important. If you have slopes, you wanna choose plants that can help hold the soil in place on those slopes. If you have areas of turf, think, think, think before you put a tree in that turf. Overall, we recommend against putting trees in turf, but if you absolutely must, there are trees that are a little bit more forgiving and amenable to being put in that setting. Definitely with trees, there are some that have very aggressive root systems and you, you wanna keep them away from walls or you know, septic systems or things like that. We want to make sure, especially with our trees, that they're going to be in scale with the space that we have, have available and also in scale with our structures. Something like this um, Palo Brea is just a really nice fit for this um, yard area, not, not encroaching too much over into the neighbors and um, not really um, being a problem with the, the structure of the house. Whereas this, this tall, 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 you know, 50 foot tall eucalyptus or these incredibly tall Mexican fan palms, um, they're, they're not in scale with these single story houses. So, um, you know, tie things together to have the most pleasing effect from your landscape. So know the mature size of your plants. And in that great plant booklet, you can get the, um, you know, general average size of your mature plants. And ironwood trees, they will usually get at least about 25 feet tall and wide. It is insane to plant them this close. Um, you know, I have short arms, but even aside from that, um, there just isn't enough room for these to grow and, um, and be healthy. There is such a concept as intermingling of plants, which I am all in favor of. I think that's a fantastic thing to let you know, plants touch and, and maybe do a little visiting, but when we have them overcrowded, that is not good. Or if they're just flat out too large for the space, something like this feathery cinna would wanna get six to eight feet tall and wide. Well, not appropriate for a very, very small scale um, duplex property. And especially if there's more than one of these put in that setting, um, you know, it was almost like the landscapers were forced 
to you know turn these into three foot by three foot irregular shapes so that they would fit the scale of the yard. Whereas you know you lose so much of the value of beauty when we do this. Around the corner, you know, down the street around the corner, there was a vacant lot where a seed happened to fall. Very same plant, these photos were taken on the same day. I think this is much more interesting, pleasing to the eye. You have all that great fragrance from the flowers rather than this one that is controlled. Um, so make sure you're, you're choosing things that are in scale and also will fit the amount of space that you have available. If your plants are overcrowded, sometimes that can really affect the, their health because they won't get enough light and air movement through their, their growth. And certainly I, I don't appreciate this. Um, that's you know the cocktail shrub, that's not intermingling. Um, that's just, I'd say overall not healthy. Don't put an agave <clears throat> that would typically mature to six feet tall and six feet wide in a two foot wide space. It's just, it doesn't make sense. And this is the same type of agave, um, very close to the um, driveway here. So I'm you know, sure they had to you know, prune this, abuse it so that it wouldn't harm people or the vehicles. And then I guess they decided that these two should match, so they abused this one as well. Um, you know, choose plants that will fit. And these, you know, this was only one foot wide. Um, these poor um, red yuccas have to be sheared all the time. So what effect are you looking for when you're choosing your plants? Every plant in our landscape has a function, whether it's just to look pretty, or it might be for screening or a windbreak. Um, maybe there's something we don't want to see um, or hear, and we can use larger scale shrubs or especially small trees to help make a, a barrier. Here, um, these hop bushes are just fabulous for screening. Um, this long, expansive brick block wall, who wants to look at one of those? So planting strategically, that can be just hidden from view. And in this residence, they wanted to have um, some privacy in their bedroom, master bedroom, perfect for this location. The hot bush will not get too large. It won't be encroaching on the sidewalk and it won't be a problem for the actual structure of the house here. It just fit, it will just be a perfectly set um, screen once these grow and fill in. And definitely trees. Most of the time we want our trees for shade. Um, so make the appropriate selection for your overall setting in your landscape. The plants that we have, they can be used to soften features like a walkway or a fountain feature, um, things like this. Um, a lot of us, you know, especially once we start getting hotter and hotter into the summer, the best time, most pleasant time to be out in our gardens would be in the evening or, you know, at night. You might want to have plants that would be part of a moon or night garden. Um, the silvery foliage plants and also light blooms reflect just the slightest bit of moonlight. Um, choose plants that will... Um, just beautifully connect your house down to the rest of the landscape. We refer to these as foundation plants. If you have some of those ridiculous strips, I don't know why they do this. Um, I think all of us have these strips. Uh, it's just, you know, a, you know, maybe two feet wide, right up against our house structure. And then you're told, well, don't have wet soil there because that will encourage termites. Well, to use plants in these areas, choose something that needs very infrequent watering. A lot of our succulent plants are ideal for a setting like that. There are a wide range of plants that um, seasonally, you know, throughout the year, your cycle, 
would be producing relatively little litter. Those are the best to use around pools so that you're not constantly fighting to keep the, the pool clean. And, and I mean, look at this, you can have um, interesting forms and just brilliant color with plants that aren't too messy for that setting. Think about um, possible problems in the landscape. Some of your yards might be open to rabbits. And you know, in that case, choose wisely. There are some plants that are a little less tasty to rabbits. So you could maybe focus on those. And there might be other insects or diseases. The just very menacing Palo Verde root borer, um, it has favorite trees, but most importantly, if we have healthy trees that aren't overwatered, aren't underwatered, aren't stressed in any way, they will be resistant to infestations by these insects. You may have heard of these beasts, the agave weevil or the snout weevil. They can take down a mature agave like you wouldn't believe because they're very, very small, but their damage can be big in these mature, you know, five or six foot wide and tall agaves. Their favorites tend to be the larger sized agaves. So we have a wide range. Some agaves only mature to a foot or so in height and spread. Focus on things like that that would be less palatable if you're aware of these beasts being in the, the area of your garden. And please avoid any invasive weedy plants such as the Mexican Palo Verde. Scottsdale does have a very nice list for you to utilize to help you steer away from invasives. Um, but things like the wed, white lead tree, they're, they're just so weedy. They recede so aggressively in areas. And definitely the fountain grass, um, it, it is a nasty invasive plant. You can hike for hours into the superstitions and find this. And what happens is plants, especially like these grasses, if they're to dry out, they are an incredible fire hazard. They will burn hotter and longer than our native vegetation, causing more damage. Even in urban settings, if there are dried plants such as this, in our urban settings, they can be also a very dangerous fire hazard. And the salt cedars. So things like this, avoid these, or if you do see them pop up into your yard, don't think, oh, great, a volunteer. And that's a volunteer that's better to like help it move on, uh, maybe into the compost pile. Uh, but overall, when you're shopping in the nursery, choose full, well-developed plants. Don't fall victim to like, oh, this plant's bigger, so it's a bargain. And don't be seduced by blooms. Actually, plants that aren't bloom are going to establish more quickly because they can focus more energy into the root development rather than those flowers and then seed production. What happens when we have a plant that's too big for its container, the root system is going to be overgrown. Having a choice of this grass or this one versus these others, these are much more in proportion to the container, indicating that they probably haven't been in the pot for too long and won't have a root system that's severely overgrown. Also with your trees, um, try to choose something that's more in proportion to the container. Um, this one just really actually cracks me up. It's considered a ground cover, yet this one, it's four foot tall. Gee, I think of a ground cover as something low growing and spreading. Uh, this has probably been in that pot, in that nursery for a few years at least. Walk away. Uh, these are a little bit better. They're only about two feet tall. They are still probably overgrown for those containers. Now, in, in the scheme of things, a lot of times I tell people, oh, the smaller plant is actually gonna be easier and faster to establish. When we're thinking of something like a soap tree yucca, they are slow growing. 
And it might be better to focus, you know, a chunk of your funds for your, your garden development into something like this that's so slow at developing. Because if you start with a smaller plant, it's going to be forever. And we'll see what one of these soap tree yuccas can turn into. So this could be pretty pricey to buy a 15 gallon size plant of this, but overall, I think that's pretty, a pretty good investment. Um, don't choose plants that have insect infestations or indications of any disease in the nursery. Um, you know, if you see something like this, choose another one, or if you have to go to a different nursery. For trees, it's important you don't want trees that have too tight of an angle for of branching. That can lead to future problems. A little bit more open branching is most ideal. And you want to have, we want to be able to see that what we call a trunk flare, the, uh, where the, the trunk hits the soil and that root system starts to flare out. That's an indication of a good plant. Um, you don't want a, a stick, you know, a pole because that will indicate that they've got the soil too high on that tree trunk. And, oh my gosh, you just walk away. <laughs> That's not good. This is an ideal root system. Just, it makes me excited to see this. The roots have filled in to hold the soil in place when you slide that plant out of the container. You know, the soil doesn't just all fall apart, but it's not wrapping around overgrown. The more overgrown a root system gets, the less health that plant is going to have down the line. Um, so if you have a, you know, a situation like this, this is extreme. So that, that should go into you know, the compost or the dumpster, whatever. But if you do have some overgrown roots, um, try to tease them apart or prune if you need to. If not, the problems occur down the line. This was a box tree. You can even see it stayed in the box so long, those roots formed to that shape. And when that happens, the roots, once it's planted into the ground, the roots will not expand. They just stay in that tight form and, and could eventually, as they, they get thicker over time, they could just do what we call girdling or strangling the trunk of the tree. If you're looking for ferret ocotillos, you want to choose those that are in good shape. They should have some weight to them and try to find some that have at least, you know, a decent little bit of root left, um, not, you know, penciled down to nothing. And overall, and this is really great. This is a retail nursery where once they get these in, they pop them into what they call a sand bed, which has some moisture. And that way they're not sitting exposed to, the roots aren't exposed to the sun and drying. And always the bare root ocotillo should have a tag on them indicating that they're legally provided. You do have an option of seed grown or field grown ocotillos. They are pricier, but overall they come with a developed root system. So. Sometimes there's a gamble whether or not your, your bare root ocotillo makes it. So paying a higher price for a developed root system, I think, again, is a wise choice. Make sure you know what you're getting. Sometimes we have just plain leucophyllum frutescens, the um, you know, Texas Ranger or barometer bush, whatever you want to call it. But there are different forms of that or what we call cultivars, cultivated varieties. Um, compacta doesn't get quite as large. Green cloud, it's got darker green leaves. So if you're looking for something, make sure you can fine tune it if there are a range of possibilities available to you and shop with that botanical name. Some of the plants might, you know, some totally different plants might share the same common name or one plant might have multiple common names, that can cause confusion in the nurseries. For instance, one of my favorites, what I call the Mexican oregano, Lipia graviolens. Well, 
there's a relative, another Lipia pulmeri, that some people also call Mexican oregano. I call that one Sonoran oregano. Unrelated polio mentamatarensis. Some people call that Mexican oregano. I call it rosemary mint. So you can see there's a range of plants, some of them very different in characteristics that all have the same common name. So you're better off shopping, whoops, with that botanical name. So now I'm gonna run through some possibilities to use in your landscape. And you have the, the botanical names there. You could take that to a nursery or you could get the botanical name um, from that booklet that I mentioned or you know, the AMWA website, the um, online form of that booklet. Um, but I'm gonna show a few native plants. And I just really encourage you to try to use at least some natives in your, your garden. They, they celebrate and um, you know, embrace our unique regional identity of flora. Our desert willow, fabulous all through the summer months. You will be graced with these fragrant, sweet smelling, gorgeous flowers that will also be attracting all kinds of hummingbird activity to your garden. This is a tree that's winter deciduous. It drops its leaves during the winter and you can get some more warming sun at that time of year when you can appreciate it. The hop bush, I showed some examples of using this as a screening. This is another great native that will, um, there are separate male and female plants. The female, ne neither of them has showy flowers. You usually wouldn't even know when they were in bloom. The, Female flower, once it gets pollinated, it starts developing these little papery wings. It transitions from green to a real gorgeous rosy color. The seeds, when they're finally totally mature and dried, um, they become tan and you can see the little seed in there. Um, it's a great food source for different wildlife forms. So with this, you're, you're offering something to wildlife. When we're just using so many oleanders everywhere, they don't provide anything for our native wildlife, really. And here you can see some examples. I talked about that one. Here, a nice screening between properties. Um, so, you know, this property owner doesn't have to look at, um, it was on a slope, so they didn't have to look at the roof of their neighbor. Um, the ironwood tree, these are absolutely gorgeous. Now, most of our desert trees generally um, would naturally have a growth habit of branching right from the base and being a, a huge mound or almost like a huge shrub. This protects them from wind damage with our monsoon winds. Um, the wind will come along and really just kind of go roll over or around these trees when they're growing in that natural form. When we have a canopy high up in just a single trunk, there tends to be more torque on those branches with the wind catching them. So this, our, our trees knew um, from way back when that this was a safer growth habit. Um, but we can prune um, these trees, the desert willow, this, our mesquites and so forth. We can prune them up a little bit to more of a conventional canopy. Um, but these are so gorgeous kind of late spring around May when they are producing their just delicate looking kind of misty pink and lavender flowers. The seeds that develop after that are a great food source for wildlife. Uh, my favorite mesquite is the native screw bean. Um, this tree stays a little smaller than the other mesquites, has lovely, those elongated um, clusters of flowers and then the seeds that develop are, um, instead of like the, the straight or slightly curved bean pod, they're wound up tight like little corkscrews in clusters, which I just think are so um, decorative on the tree. The superstition mallow is a wonderful shrub that can be so, so drought tolerant once we get it established. It blooms in cycles throughout the year. You'll have a flush of bloom and seed production, then another flush of bloom and seed production. So many times through the year, you can have these 
lovely cup-shaped um, kind of orangish yellow flowers that are a great source for our native bees, especially our native pink fairy duster. If it's grown in full sun and not over watered, it generally doesn't exceed even four foot, um, usually about three foot to four foot in height and spread. Um, best in full sun, and they have the most delicate sprays or puffs or fairy duster flower clusters here. It's the male reproductive stamens that are, are so fluffy and flashy. And they stay small, so I don't understand why anybody feels the need to get those head trim trimmers out. Um, natural form, they just have a softening effect here and there, um, you know, contrasting with hardscape or our sculptural succulent forms in the landscape. This is a great fall bloomer, the turpentine bush. It will draw so many species of butterflies into your garden. Um, around September, October, November, with these brilliant golden yellow flowers. And of course, if you caress the foliage, it will release. I find it to be a very clean, fresh scent, but somebody's olfactory system read it as turpentine. Oh, well. Um, flat top buckwheat. This is a fabulous low-growing mounding plant that has the most delicate little flowers in the spring and again in the fall. Loves the full sun exposure as does our desert lavender. This is a shrub, it can kind of vary in form from a little bit more um, upright to um, lower and wide spreading, but usually overall kind of an open growth habit. It has these tiny delicate little purple flowers that will attract hummingbirds and butterflies and pollinator bees to your garden. And if you gently caress the foliage, it has a lavender-like scent. The chuparosas are fabulous long bloomers from around October or November, right on through till usually at least April, if not May. The flowers are just perfect for the hummingbirds and they have a light cucumber flavor. You can toss some in your salad. We have most often the red one available, but some nurseries do provide the yellow blooming. Hummingbirds aren't choosy on that flower color. So choose the one that fits better for your color palette in your garden. Chocolate flowers. The flowers will greet you in the morning with a sweet chocolate scent. Definitely fabulous. They bloom all through the warm season from around mid or late spring right on through, usually at least through November. And they are also great at attracting butterflies to your garden. As do the goodings for Venus. Butterflies love these. They are so sweet smelling. The petunias, if you're familiar with those, petunias have a scent very similar to the native goodings for Bina. These are great in full sun to very, very, very light shade. The Blackfoot Daisy, you definitely want to put these in full sun, and they do have to have a well-draining soil. They bloom almost year-round. Take a little break, maybe mid-winter. The flowers, another example of a great butterfly plant. And the, the flowers are very nicely sweet scented as well. Oops. For that evening garden or night garden, the white tufted evening primrose, it has a very light, delicate floral scent. Those flowers, the white, it will reflect even the slightest bit of moonlight. So they're beautiful to have in a garden. Um, they open in the evening. And then the next morning when the sun hits them, those flowers will wither. Pinstamins, we have numerous pinstamins to select from. Most of them are spring bloomers. Of the spring bloomers, this is one with the most elongated bloom period from around February to usually through April into May, sometimes even into June. Full sun or very, very light shade. And yes, it's a favorite of the hummingbirds. You guys are catching on. The Angelita daisy, 
is another one that blooms almost year round, just kind of in cycles. Flower seed, flower seed, wonderful one for the butterflies. They love those daisy-like flowers or flowers where they can you know, land and sip nectar. These are sun worshipers. Um, they don't tolerate very much shade. Um, nice perennial bunch grasses. This is one of my favorites, the purple threon. It has just such incredible movement with slight breezes. The seed heads have kind of a, a glisteny pink color, or I guess somebody interpreted it as purple, um, that is very attractive. And you usually get a couple or three cycles of the, the seed development on these. Um, here's a mass planting adjacent to a golf course. And, and just such a lovely feature, whether it's just you know one or a few in your garden or a mass planting, uh, very drought tolerant. And really cool, the side oats grandma. In the fall, they'll develop seeds on stems that they're all kind of hanging in, in one plane on those um, bloom stems. The Arizona grape ivy is fabulous. Its foliage is just spectacular. It looks a little bit like ivy, um, not always do these produce fruit, but when they do, um, I guess somebody thought they looked like little tiny grapes. The foliage is just gorgeous. They can grow in full sun to light or even um, a moderate to even sometimes dense shade. So very adaptable to different conditions. And they grow these little tuber systems. Um, so if they do tend to with a hard freeze die back, they will rebound rapidly. Um, trailing indigo bush is a tough as nails, drought tolerant, um, primarily spring and fall bloomer, but you can have a little carryover even through the summer and winter, attracting butterflies and our tough as nails, desert milkweed. If you have a full sun location, these get to be anywhere from about three to five feet tall and wide, put one of these in for the, the monarchs, both the monarchs and the queens will um, complete their life cycle on these plants. And they're so, so tough um, and very sculptural in form. The Ocotillo, they have a spring bloom that is just magnificent, as well as the magnificent hummingbirds. Well, not literally the species magnificent hunting, hummingbirds, but um, really cool hummingbirds will visit the flowers in the spring. And they'll use the stem tips to perch on um, through any time of the year. Bear grass gives an interesting form and texture to your garden and the leaf tips dry out naturally and get these kind of curly Q forms to them, which is I think just so, so interesting and a wonderful feature of these plants. And they're very adaptable to um, full sun, to light or even moderate shade. Um, the yucca ilata, so I, I showed you those 15 gallon plants. A lot of our um, tree form yuccas are slow to develop. So you might want to invest a little bit more money in something a little bit sizable that you, know, you can actually um, see it develop into a tree form. But our yuccas, most of them are spring blooming, kind of mid or late spring with just some magnificent flowers. The, Flowers um, are um, sometimes lower down when you've got the lower spreading um, yuccas, you can really get a look at them, but from a height, you can't enjoy them quite as well on these tree forms. But from that 15 gallon size, um, your, your yucca will slowly grow, develop through these forms, and then eventually get its trunk. And the cactus, um, nice to fit into small spaces. We have our hedgehog and even our native fish hook barrel. These bloom with the um, summer on into the fall and the fruits that develop are also very colorful. Again, these are best in full sun to just the very lightest shade locations. One of my favorites, the beaver tail, you have to have a really well-draining soil. But there are some cactus such as these that can fit into a smaller space. You don't have to have a, a huge expanse for some of the you know, 
very large specimen cactus. And then, your tea? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I know that we have, um, we're kind of coming yes. up on time, uh, but we do have a question. Oh, um, sure. Can you please name some clean plants for around the pool? Okay. Yeah, a lot, especially a lot of the succulent plants are going to be producing less um, litter through the year cycle. So I, I think succulent plants are a really good place to start to build your pool scape. There is, and if you go into that system from the Cooperative Extension Publications, you can access a list of um, plants that are more suitable for pool scapes. But, um, you know, something even like our, our Chuparosa, it doesn't produce a whole lot of litter or the turpentine bush that I showed. So you do have a lot of selections here even that are, aren't going to be a nuisance as far as debris. Yeah. Um, so the purple prickly pear, Mother Nature's color combinations, that beautiful yellow with the purple hues in the spring is fabulous. And don't forget the annual wildflowers. You'd want to plant these in the fall. Um, we used to recommend, you know, October, but I'm thinking maybe late October into November now is the best time to put your seed down. Um, they do most germinate when this when air temperatures are more consistently 85 degrees or lower, and that seems to be coming later. <laughs> um, so don't forget that they're so easy to start from seed and you can just have beautiful color in your landscapes um, with very little effort so thank you do we have any other questions well i hope you've gotten an idea of the process to go through in really selecting the best plant for the the right place and remember you have that online access or online resource of this booklet, which the booklet's great, but if you go online, it's even better because you have some search features to help you narrow down things. And that you could use to help figure out some more um, examples of pool suitable plants. Thank you all. Awesome. Thank you, Kirti. Uh, for anyone who has been raptly listening, um, now is the time to get in your questions. So for anybody who joined us late, there should be a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen and um, type in your questions and we will get them answered. So we do have a question. Uh, can you plant yes. elephant food around totem pole? Yes. The elephant food, it's quite drought tolerant once you get it established. And I'd say they would be quite compatible around a cactus. Yes. Yeah. And speaking of elephant food, that's a great one because it's, you know, doesn't have anything prickly and it's very friendly. That would be a wonderful one to include around a pool. Do we have other questions? I'm assuming everybody is furiously typing. So we'll give them uh, a minute or two, but Kirti, I guess then our, our question to you is, I know at the beginning with the, the poll, you said your, your answer to your favorite desert adapted plant is there's too many to, yeah, to choose, a, um, but my, my would favorite, you highlight two or three? My, oh, oh man, oh, <laughs> you, you could have warned me. Um, Sorry. My favorite plant is like a whole list. I would have to say I love the chuparosas. Um, they they have such a long bloom period, and just are so wonderful at drawing in hummingbirds into my garden. And to top that off, the flowers are edible. They have a, a, a mild cucumber flavor with the sweet nectar in them. So I love sprinkling those in salad or just nibbling on them when I'm out in my yard. And oh golly. This is so rough. I love that magenta bloom on the hedgehog cactus. Also, I do absolutely love the um, that superstition or Indian mallow. Not only does it have lovely flowers, the leaves are, they're so cute and heart-shaped, um, but they're velvety soft. Um, so for me, things that are fragrant 
um, or feel good <laughs> or taste good, they're, they're, those are things on my favorite list. I like it. Um, we have a few additional questions. Um, recommendations for plants in shady areas, such as under trees. Yes, there are some great plants. One of my favorites to, it can grow in full sun or under a tree is what we call Arizona fold wing. It's our native dicliptera. It blooms in cycles throughout the year. It has lovely um, kind of a, a little bit pea-like flowers. They're not really pea form, but a little bit similar. Um, that rosy purple color, and they're great. The native um, white plumbago is fabulous um, in light to, to even moderate shade. So under a mesquite, you know, can it be that you've raised? That would be another great option. It will bloom beautifully in, in that shade. And that Arizona grape ivy, you can use it, you know, as, as a vine, but you can also let it grow as a ground cover. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Do plants with flowers uh, exist that don't attract bees? Hmm. There aren't, I would say there aren't very many of them. Um, the, our, generally our cactus flowers are great, um, you know, drawers of bees. The, that's a rough one, um, truly. Uh, most flowers are going to attract either honeybees or our native bees. Um, aloe flowers, well, even bees are attracted to those. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. And one or two additional questions. Um, first, what can you grow in a large patio planter, 19 feet long, two feet wide, and one and three quarters deep for a screen? Uh, and the area is west facing full sun. Can the plant spill over a little bit perhaps? If that's the case, something like, um, Maybe the slipper plant, uh, a euphorbia, that might be one. Definitely you could use its relative, the candelia, but that's going to usually not get more than about two feet in height. Um, there are some of the Hesperallos that have been developed in the last you know, five or 10 years that stay a little bit more narrow and upright. That could be a really good option because some of those are, most of them are going to get at least three foot to four foot um, tall with their leaves. So I'd say that might be a good thing to look into. And so that, that would be their, um, you know, relatives of our, you know, normally seen red yucca. And there was confirmation, yes, it can spill over, so. Yeah. Um, it, as long as they've got a good soil base, the, the slipper plant might be a, a very nice um, selection, but definitely the, some of those Hesperallos that are a little bit more upright in their growth habit would be great. So check with a nursery. Um, the grower of most of those is Mountain State's Wholesale Nursery, but you can check with your local nursery to see um, if they order from Mountain States, maybe they could, if they don't have them available, they could order some for you. Thank you, Kirti. Uh, any advice on finding a good qualified landscape designer specializing in xeriscape design for the Scottsdale area? Oh, golly. Well, it needs some fine tuning. Hopefully soon our smartscape.org website will be would be a good search um, base for you. Um, we, we do still have some glitches in it that it, it's not functioning as well as we'd like yet. But um, something like that could be a resource where you could enter your area and what you were looking for, you know, design. 
Um, golly, other than that, I really wouldn't know offhand, you know, any recommendations. Sorry. And it looks like we have one final question. Other than hot bush, what other plants are good for fences or walls? If you don't mind slow growing, one of my favorites is the Arizona rosewood. It's an evergreen. The leaves are oblong, kind of similar to a, an oleander or, or the hot bush. And they're, they're dark green, kind of leathery leaves. Those, the only drawback is it would be slow growing, but they usually get to be at maturity, you know, we're talking years, um, about maybe eight feet wide, up to 10 feet, but usually more about eight feet wide. And eventually, slowly, they can get up to about 15 feet in height. Um, that is, I think, another great one to use for a, a hedge type um, situation. But if you want a faster growth, the, the hot bush would be a, a better selection. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kirti. Those are all the questions we have. Um, for anybody who's still with us on the line, uh, there's just a few resources here. If you have questions that you think of um, with all of the great information that you received tonight, you're welcome to email us at waterconservation at scottsdaleaz.gov. Um, this is our main uh, line number if you prefer to talk to somebody over the phone. Uh, and we really appreciate that you joined us today. 